In today's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Susan Carruthers. Susan is a historian and professor of United States and international history at the University of Warwick. She is the author of six books, including the book we're going to talk about today, which is called Dear John, Love and Loyalty in Wartime America. She previously taught at Rutgers University for 15 years and has held visiting fellowships at Harvard, Princeton, and the Woodrow Wilson Center. In our conversation today, we talk about the history of the Dear John letter and how it became part of the cultural fabric of America. We talk about social norms and gender roles surrounding marriage and relationships and the difficulties that war and time and distance can put on a partnership. We discuss how different institutions like the military or the church or the media grappled with the Dear John letter and the things that it represented in these times of war. We talked about the technology of communication and how that changed over time and the different challenges that that presents and presented to members of the military and their spouses. We discussed the ethics of collecting evidence as a historian, the prevailing psychological wisdom behind these topics and how that changed over time and a whole lot more. I really enjoyed this interview, definitely learned a lot, and I hope you do as well. I thought we could get started. Maybe you could talk about some of the types of things that interest you historically and the type of history you research and study and how that led you into the Dear John letter and relationships in times of war, these types of topics? I have really been studying war in different settings and various different time periods, but mostly in the 20th century for my whole academic career. I got interested in these sorts of questions as an undergraduate. I took a course on propaganda in World War II because it was the only one that sounded very interesting to me. And that was really got what got me hooked. So I did a PhD on British colonial counterinsurgencies back in the early 1990s when no one had yet rediscovered British colonial counterinsurgency as, as a, a topic of present day interest as well. Um, but at a certain point in my career, my interest turned more towards the United States and how I got interested in Dear John Letters and the content of this particular book was really from a couple of, of different avenues that intersected. So the first of those was doing the research for my previous book, which is called The Good Occupation, and that explored the experiences of men and women who belonged to the occupying armies of, of the U.S. military in Japan, Germany, Korea, and the various other places that the United States occupied after World War II. And I was trying to figure out what the experience of, of being an occupation soldier was like from a, as many different vantage points as I could. And I read hundreds of correspondences between personnel in uniform and their loved ones. And I became very intrigued by the way in which even when people knew that the censor was reading their mail, they were often very, very candid in divulging the anxieties that they experienced around their relationships, their durability, their partner's fidelity, and so on. And, and that piqued my curiosity about how romantic intimacy could be sustained or the many, many obstacles that make it really hard to make a relationship survive and outlive war. And I've also had a very long-standing interest in communications media. So I earlier in my career, I wrote a lot about communications and war, media and war. And in those projects, I was interested in television, radio, TV, broadcast media. But increasingly, I've, I've become much more interested, partly for the reason I just outlined about the, the sort of voyeuristic thrill of reading people's private correspondences in the, those private ways in which 
uh, stories about war, um, understandings about conflict get shaped through interpersonal communication. So that was also what led me to the Diachon project. As you kind of outlined there, there's sort of two things going on here. You, you're talking about this specific concept of the Dear John letter, which um, I think you define roughly as the spouse uh, sending a letter overseas to the, usually the man, uh, but it could be a woman, um, the military service personnel uh, sort of getting dumped. And then a lot of times there's this added sting of there's another person in the picture back home. But also sort of the bigger context is this idea of relationships in war and, and something that's always been a thing, which is, you know, how do you navigate a relationship when you're oftentimes overseas in times of war or just separated by distance and geography? So why do you think it is that the Dear John letter became sort of a cultural phenomenon? Why did it become sort of a thing? I think you argue that it happens mostly in World War II where it kind of becomes this cultural thing. Well, it's a little bit hard to say categorically why it isn't until World War II that anyone coins the phrase Dear John to describe the kind of letter that you just you just outlined. And of course, the, the definition typically is a bit broader. It needn't necessarily be a spouse. It could be a girlfriend. It could be a fiancé. Um, but my best guess about why it isn't until 1942 that the GIs first come up with this phrase um, has quite a lot to do with just the truly epic scale of mobilization in, in World War II. There are so many young men and obviously a smaller number of young women who are in, in uniform. I mean, we're talking about around 16 million American citizens who serve in the various branches of the armed forces in World War II. Um, and I think around 12 million of those at some point are dispatched overseas. So for those, but even for the ones who never go to Europe or Asia or any other theater of war, separation is a dominant wartime experience, even if you're being sent to a training camp or you're deployed somewhere in the continental United States. So being away from a partner, um, an experience which is, is difficult under the best of circumstances, which for, for most people, World War II emphatically was not, makes it really hard to sustain those kinds of intimate connections. And I think because so many people found, having been deployed often away from home for two, three, uh, perhaps even longer years in some cases, that their relationships were failing and that they were being sent letters by their partners telling them that things were, were over. So to me, I, I think a, a large piece of this story is about the, the sort of mass experience of deployment and along with it, mass anxieties about faithfulness on the home front. And for, for quite a lot of men, but but not as many, I think, as, as were rumored to be the recipients of Dear John, that experience of, of getting the most dreaded of all letters from a woman back home. Yeah, so that, that makes total sense, just the, the size and the scope of World War II sort of facilitating this process. But another thing that you also outline is that it kind of goes against what you might think, even though the size and scale of this Dear John phenomenon is potentially increasing, the evidence, at least the hard evidence for it, isn't necessarily there because it just kind of makes sense. People, they get a Dear John letter, they might burn it, they might destroy it, uh, they might use it as toilet paper. Um, they might indeed. <laughs> the, the, the expression bump comes from somewhere after all. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, um, how do you go about as a historian collecting evidence and sort of telling a story about this, um, even though, you know, you wouldn't be able to just line up, uh, you know, the most famous 25 Dear John letters and, and just have those immediately at your disposal? Well, you couldn't have, I like this idea of the 25 most famous <laughs> Dear John letters. Uh, of course, such a thing could never be compiled, even if one wanted to do that. Uh, for the reason that you suggested, and perhaps rather naively when I started out researching this topic, I did imagine I would find more extant Dear John letters in archives around the, the country than than I did. And and it probably doesn't take very much reflection to, to figure out, of, of course, there weren't going to be 
troves and troves of, of Dear John letters. They were, as you just said, often very hastily consigned to oblivion, or even if they weren't immediately destroyed in, in one of the many ways in, in which men typically got rid of them, they might spend some time as the objects of collective defacement or some kind of, of sort of recuperative mechanism that was shared amongst groups of men um, might be engaged in. So I found one Dear John letter that had been sent to an American serviceman who was imprisoned in a, in a German POW camp at the time. And this made the rounds, and so his friends would annotate it and write things in the margins and, and so on. And that su survived secondhand. It was included in a scrapbook that finally made its way to, I think, the Air Force Academy's library, and, and someone found it there and, and sent it to me. And, and in, in some ways, that's, of course, an idiosyncratic and rare example. But I think in as much as we know for sure that some Dear Johns were written with the, the forms of words that are publicly available to us, it often is because men have, have shared these and in different ways they enter into public circulation. So there's a deep, one particular Dear John story which really runs through the book, as, as you know, having read it, uh, which took the form of a V-mail, V for Victory Mail, sent by a young woman in Newark, New Jersey, which was my adoptive hometown for a decade, to her boyfriend who she'd never actually met. She'd only communicated with him by letters, and he was somewhere in Britain at the time, and she told him to go to hell. And we know she told him to go to hell, and we know exactly how she phrased this, because the recipient was so upset and irate to have received such a, a shocking and appalling and unpatriotic missive that he sent it to Yank, the Army's weekly magazine, and Yank promptly published it including her address, which, uh, of course, gave me a lot of interesting correspondence sent to this young woman, uh, which she kept. So there's a handful of, of Dear Johns that we know for sure women really did write in the form that we can read them. But what I realized at a certain point in, in my research journey was that it was actually going to be much more productive to approach the Dear John genre not as a particular kind of letter written by women, although, of course, women have written these letters, but as an oral tradition uh, perpetuated by men. In other words, most of what we know about this particular kind of, of letter comes from what men have had to say about it. And there's a very, very rich tradition of storytelling um, and veterans' writings um, about Dear John letters. So a lot of the time that I spent in archives and perhaps especially the Veterans History Project, which is at the Library of Congress. I was spending, um, as we are now, with um, earphones on, and I was listening to oral history testimony, knowing that somewhere in this oral history, I was going to find a Dear John story. So that was one of the largest um, kinds of source material I looked at. But I looked at all sorts of other things, wherever Dear John letters and the phenomena that Dear John letters are associated with, like marital breakdown, infidelity, got discussed. Yeah, so again, I, I think all of that, you know, aside from the historical evidence and all that stuff, it just makes intuitive sense, right, that even though probably most of these Dear John letters are being destroyed, you can imagine that men are kind of sitting around the camp talking about, you know, relationship issues. You can imagine that... uh it becomes a bigger thing than just the letter itself. It becomes sort of a narrative, a story. Um, and as you say, even though mostly women are the ones writing the Dear John letter, it becomes men who are primarily in the historical record, the ones kind of telling the story about it. And I think maybe you also argue that there are these sort of institutions involved as well, whether it's the military or the media or uh, the Catholic Church, there's different ways that they kind of latch onto the story and, and kind of uh, latch onto the cultural phenomenon. And I was wondering if you could talk about the ways that institutions sort of spin their own narratives around relationships and war and uh, what the proper social expectations are for women on the home front and, and these types mm. of things. Yeah, that's a great question. So 
you're quite right that, of course, in wartime, all sorts of different entities, institutions, organizations, as well as private individuals uh, get very invested in the business, in particular, of trying to shore up relationships that involve at least one, if not two, military partners. Um, and, and this is a phenomenon that perhaps plays out most intensely in World War II, given, as I say, the, the, the truly epic scale of, of mobilization for, for that war. So, so if we think about what's going on in, in World War II, um, we find, I mean, uh, we could think about other wars as well, but, but, but certainly where I begin this, this story is, is by thinking about, about, for example, female civilians who are particularly vociferous in, in trying to ensure that women um, maintain both the correct kind of correspondence with men in uniform and that they sustain, once they've entered into a romantic relationship, that they stay the course and that they don't even think about uh, breaking it off, especially while that serviceman is deployed overseas. So in Britain, we have a term agony aunt for a female advice columnist who writes back to, to letters that typically young women send when they're in emotional distress, they're having relationship issues. Um, in my 15 years in the United States, I don't think I ever encountered anyone using that term agony aunt, but, but you certainly know who I'm referring to, advice columnists like Dear Abby, Dorothy Dix. Um, I mean, you can name, I'm sure, quite a lot of, of, of those individuals. And one of the things that was really striking to me was that regardless of, of what decade we were in or, or what war was um, then current, that from the 1940s right through into the 21st century, the, the advice that I just mentioned about, you know, do not break up with a soldier, the absolute worst thing you can do is send a Dear John letter, was being played out in World War II, in the Korean War, Vietnam, right on up into the 21st century. And, and so a lot of, of work has gone on by female disciplinarians. So I think it would definitely be a mistake to imagine that it's only in the armed forces that there's a lot of, of industriousness channeled into trying to ensure that emotional relationships, intimate partnerships outlast deployment and, and survive the end of, of conflict. Uh, you mentioned a couple of other interesting ones. So um, the participation of the Catholic Church or indeed other denominations in this story is, is quite important. Again, perhaps World War II marked a, a high watermark for, for the church's involvement. So um, the military ordinariat that is where the, the sort of central um, branch of, of the army that, that sort of is the official channel by which the, the church and the chaplaincy interacts with, with military structures was very active. There was a radio program, for example, called Chaplain Jim, which had a huge listenership, which was a kind of soap opera dedicated to, to sort of peddling storylines that were aimed primarily at both reassuring the home front that their boys were being taken care of, that their spiritual well-being was a matter of great concern to the army. But a lot of the plots did also hinge on questions about romantic relationships, about ensuring that they lasted. And, and one of the dominant sort of catchphrases of, of Chaplain Jim was, was this very insistent message to keep writing, keep writing cheerfully, and so on. And that mantra was also being pervaded by magazines, by advertisers. Everyone really, it seemed, had, had sort of jumped on the bandwagon to turn letter writing not into a, a private sort of source of, of pleasure and connection, but really a patriotic obligation that, that, that young women especially were compelled to perform on behalf of the nation, as well as the young men they were writing to. Right. Now, the controversial, I, I guess, aspect of this that you go over in the book, and there's sort of different sides sort of playing out. And you can imagine the one side that says, look, as we kind of outlined earlier, this is a war of size and scope that no one's ever even thought about before. So, you know, maybe in that case, in these issues of relationships and uh, these types of things, you know, one side might say you don't want to add any psychological, extra psychological burden to soldiers fighting overseas. So, uh, 
in that fashion, you might want to, you know, not do anything sudden like break off a relationship or dump somebody or write a letter that isn't uh, patriotic and cheerful because that might impact the war effort. But then on the other side, you have this sort of complicated issue where relationships are complicated and time and distance can uh, create problems. And a lot of times, as you outlined in the book, these relationships aren't even real relationships. Sometimes one side or the other is sort of reading into things that aren't there. I'm sure we've all been there before. So women on the home front might feel these sorts of societal pressures and, um, you know, fighting against societal norms. So how would you sort of outline that, that sort of internal struggle that surely a lot of women on the home front must have faced? Yeah, I think um, you're taking us into some of the most complicated and and difficult terrain of, of the book. And I think you're quite right that one of the things I hope readers will take away from the book is a more sort of complicated and, and nuanced appreciation of, of what makes sustaining a romantic relationship when one or perhaps both of the partners are deployed. Um, why is this all so hard? And why should we perhaps not be so quick to blame a woman who writes a Dear John letter or uses some other technology if we're talking about the later 20th or 21st centuries? Because it does seem to me that is the sort of dominant story that, that gets told about these letters is that the women who send them are both cowardly and cruel. Those are the two stock epithets that almost invariably, regardless of whatever war we're talking about, seem to be employed to describe the women who, who send them. But of course, as, as you pointed out yourself, um, not infrequently, two people may have a connection with one another that they understand to be of a very different character um, and very different level or nature of, of commitment. And, and I think that's definitely true if we think about World War II or if we think about Vietnam or any of the conflicts in which young women are, are being constantly told, right to men in uniform, it's something that you have to do to keep their spirits up, you're aiding the war effort, that young women you know, quite often may well have felt that they were simply doing what, what they were being told to do, but, but they had no notion that the young men who were the recipients of their letters, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they may never have met, started to think, oh, I have a girlfriend now. And when, when I get home, you know, maybe we'll get engaged, maybe we'll get married, and a whole elaborate, I mean, it's not hard to see why, why young men who are lonely, they're away from home, they might be in, in sort of considerable personal danger would latch on to any sort of a shred of, of romantic hope and possibility and fashion perhaps quite an elaborate um, mental image of how this relationship might play out in, in a, a possible post-war future. And of course, a young woman, I, mean, I came across several of, of these sorts of stories, young women get increasingly anxious about the tenor of the letters they're getting back from young men who obviously think that what's at stake in, in this um, exchange of letters is really something radically different from what they have in mind. So no wonder in some cases they wanted to extricate themselves so that, that this pattern of misunderstanding, of, of sort of un, unwarranted expectation didn't, um, didn't proceed any further. Now, it also seems to me that in terms of the, the whole idea that Dear John letter writers are cowardly um, and that the reason why they send Dear John letters is because they're simply too too timid or um, too you know reluctant to have a face-to-face -face conversation to, to break off a relationship, they're unwilling to, to, to wait and do that when the man gets back. It's also to, to inject into our understanding of these things that that if we think about what advice columnists who are telling women this are actually asking them to do, it seems to me that this advice may be quite misplaced or, or in some cases, actively dangerous. That to, to, to encourage a man, perhaps for years, to believe that his partner's affections are unaltered, love is undying, it hasn't changed over the course of his deployment, and then wait till that moment when he's coming back, which is often quite a, a challenging transition out of active frontline service, back into domestic life, back into the realm of civil society. That can be a hard transition for anyone to manage. But if you imagine that, that men who may be um, 
suffering emotional, psychological damage from wartime service, what we would now term PTSD, to be confronted at the moment they return home with a woman saying, well, actually, it's over. It's been over for quite some time. It's just that you didn't know it. I didn't want to tell you while you were away. That can lead to and has historically led in some cases to incidences of extreme violence and even homicide. So I think we definitely need to be careful about a, a sort of knee-jerk response to the, the senders of Dear John letters before we brandish them all just ipso facto as, as cowardly. I can imagine there might be some people that might be listening to this and just sort of saying, you know, oh, well, this is just a women's issue or this is, you know, sort of cultural uh, stuff that isn't really relevant to the war effort. And in general, you know, the tie should go in a relationship, the tie should go to the person fighting overseas. But I think as you outline in the book, the military itself is very concerned with this issue over the course of the years and their thoughts on relationships and how to handle Dear John letters and the psychology behind it. You know, this is something they take very seriously because as you said, it it could have, you know, significant impacts on not just the soldier, but people at home, the family uh, structure and kind of how the military thinks about it itself and the values it represents. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe talk about how the military as a whole, sort of as an institution, what their thoughts are, what their policies are on relationships and and people overseas. Well, that depends a little bit on which war we're talking about, um, because clearly the military has changed very substantially from the 1940s to the present, and um, especially in the wake of, of the Vietnam War, when we have a major shift in terms of, of how um, people are brought into um, the, the military labor force. In other words, we don't have any wars after Vietnam that are fought with the draft. So we're looking at, at the era of the all-volunteer forces. And along with, with that comes over the course of the 70s, but particularly from the 1980s onwards, a military which is much more avowedly family-friendly and uh, dedicating a lot of resources to encouraging uh, men and women who, who want to be married and in uniform and who also may want to have children um, and be family people, but also serve in the armed forces to make all of that, that possible, um, which is quite a change from the situation when America went into World War II and in the months leading up to it, when clearly more and more young men were being drafted into the armed forces from 1940 onwards. There, there was a very strong... Uh, pressures to discourage young men fr from marrying. And indeed, the, the lowest ranks of enlisted men could not marry without their commanding officer's approval. And the military made it clear that, that in their minds, the most preferable kind of enlisted man really was single. He was without dependence. He was unattached. Um, because a, a, as what you just said was hinting at, I mean, for, for the military as an institution, Dear John letters are not a cultural motif. They're, they're not simply a story, if anything is ever simply a story. But issues about relationships, um, about commitment, about anxiety over infidelity loom super large uh, for obvious reasons, that men who are worried that their partner is unfaithful or who've just heard that their relationship is over often, of course, enter an extremely sort of volatile and, and, and dangerous psychological state, which may well affect their own operational efficiency, their own safety, but could also jeopardize their whole unit's operational efficiency. So some of the latter chapters of the book deal with these extremely difficult and challenging issues about how Dear John letters have been linked with all sorts of behaviors that the military would wish to discourage from men going AWOL. Um, they might just be well, leaving their base to go and get as drunk as they possibly can. Uh, they might be deserting um, in a more serious and sustained way. Dear John letters have been linked with the commission of atrocities. And as we know, particularly over the last 15 years or so, as the armed forces have wrestled mightily with escalating rates of suicide, that relationship between failed relationships and Dear John letters specifically 
And lethal self-harm has been one that the military has devoted a lot of energy, both to trying to, to analyze and, of course, put in place structures that will both shore up marriages and romantic partnerships, but also try to uh, drive down rates of suicide. So suicide prevention training has, has occupied ever more resources and, and time in all branches of services. I'm not sure if you, uh, how much attention to this that you paid in the book, but one of the things I picked up on as I was reading as sort of a, a fan of psychology was that it seems to me like there's been sort of a shift in the way that maybe the military thinks about relationships and these types of things, whereas maybe during World War II, maybe during Vietnam, there was more of a psychoanalytic approach, may have been taken back in the 40s and 50s with psycho psychology as a whole, has sort of given way to a, a more humanistic approach focusing on relationships and self-actualization and uh, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Is that something you found, or was that just me reading into things? No, I, I think what you describe corresponds pretty much with exactly what I found. So in the 1940s during World War II, a huge proportion of the American psychiatric profession actually joined up and, and, and served in the, in the military medical profession. And at the time, of course, the, the sort of dominant strand of American um, psychiatry was very, very heavily influenced by Freudianism. And I, I looked at, at various sort of private collections of, of papers. There's a couple of really good ones in the Library of Congress of, of, of men who, very eminent psychiatrists, um, psychologists who, who served as most of their peers did in World War II. And a lot of, of their diagnosis of, of why men were susceptible to um, what were called neuropsychiatric complaints in that war. So we're talking about, of course, decades before PTSD was enshrined in, in DSM-2 in, in, in 1980. I mean, they, they tended to think that, that men who were susceptible to, to psychological breakdown and these neuropsychiatric complaints often had a history of troubled childhoods, which they tended to trace back more commonly to, to deficient mothers than than fathers, so that was something that was quite intriguing um, to find over. The, so there's a small portion of the book which sort of traces the, the story about relationships and who should uh, be providing what kind of emotional support to, to servicemen back to World War One, when there was much more of a sort of a cult of the patriotic mother and mothers, not girlfriends and wives, were were being lauded as as the most important mainstays of servicemen's emotional lives. And over a relatively short space of time between the two world wars, mothers have really, really fallen out of favor. And, and uh, the, the sort of consensus in, in the, the sci sciences seemed to be very much along sort of Freudian lines that, that mothers very often were responsible for inflicting psychic injury in, in childhood. And that, that a lot of those files too point to, to enormous levels of anxiety around fidelity. And so these guys were also sort of tra tracing links between men who enter into marriages with women who psychologically least resemble their mothers very heavily. And, and so they are unselfconsciously re sort of repeating these unhealthy patterns and, and kinds of relationships. Now, fast forward to, to later wars, and obviously by the time of the Vietnam War, the military psychiatric profession looks quite different. It doesn't tend to think in such rigidly or reductively Freudian ways. It doesn't demonize mothers, perhaps quite so insistently. And then taking the story up into the 21st century, you're right that you now in the in the military, there's much more emphasis on cognitive behavioral therapy in sort of positive psychology. Over the last decade, resilience has been a major sort of buzz term and that, that whole branch of of the scythe professions that are dedicated to trying to make both service personnel and their spouses and their whole family units more resilient, um, often using techniques imported from CBT. Right. And just as the prevailing wisdom behind something like psychology changes over time from the 40s uh, all the way to today, as you sort of mentioned earlier, the the technology of 
letter writing. You mentioned the V mail earlier. Uh, you can imagine just plain pen and paper being a, a big thing in the wars of the past. But nowadays we have, of course, social media and texting and instant communication. And I think one of the things you, you say is that, you know, one era is not necessarily more or less difficult than another era to, to sort of deal with these romantic issues and relationship problems and Dear John letters, the slow kind of communication of letter writing has its its own pluses and minuses. And then the instant communication, uh, as we all know from today, has its own uh, pluses and minuses. So I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, technology and how it's evolved is a, a quite a big piece of the book. There's a, a chapter that's devoted to this, but but you could trace that theme through um, other of the chapters besides the one that's specifically about the evolution of the ways in which deployed personnel and their loved ones back home can stay in touch. And it seems as though almost every war has given rise to some new method of connectivity that has been billed as, you know, the new <laughs> big best Thing. So whether it was V-mail in World War II, and perhaps for the benefit of your listeners who don't know what that was, V-mail was um, a particular kind of, of pre-printed stationery, a bit like an aerogram, that was then um, photographed and reduced onto microfilm. So this was very appealing, of course, to the US government and the military because it saved huge amounts of space at a time when literally millions and millions of pieces of correspondence are flying back and forth. Um, every week to be able to shrink a letter onto just a frame of microfilm and then develop it at the other end was was a really substantial benefit. It saved space on cargo planes and it, it also greatly increased the speed with which mail arrived overseas. Um, but then by the 1960s, the big new technology of the Vietnam era is the tape. So we're talking, first of all, about open tapes, you know, big reel-to-reel um, -reel kind of tape recordings that in turn um, sort of seed place to enclosed cassette tapes and, and so on. Um, and a lot of Dear John's storytelling also is, is bound up with that war's latest technology. I don't know that women did indeed send Dear John tapes, but suddenly one psychiatrist who um, has popularized this notion, who looms quite large in different points in my book, a guy called Dr. Emmanuel Tane, wrote a, a professional paper, which then got picked up in all sorts of other places, in which he, he wrote that, that women were indeed sending tapes to their boyfriends in Vietnam. And they weren't tape recordings of them, dear John, I'm very sorry to have to tell you, dot, dot, dot. In Tane's um, critique of this phenomenon, women were actually recording themselves in amorous encounters with their new boyfriends and then sending these sort of, I guess we might call it avenge porn rather than revenge porn, um, tapes to their GI in, or ex-GI in Vietnam. Uh, and a lot of people picked up on this because this seems both horrifying and intriguing. And so you find reference to this phenomenon in other places, almost invariably sourced back to this guy, Dr. Tane, but I wasn't able to find any corroborative evidence, which I would have expected to do, having looked at um, and listened to hundreds and hundreds of oral histories and, and many, many other kinds of sources. So maybe one woman sent one tape of that kind, which no longer exists. Um, but I think it's quite telling that, that that story got told and that story got repeated. And now, of course, as you say, in the 21st century, there are Dear John stories about being dumped by text, by finding, uh, uh, you know, a social media status update. You've been not just sent to Dear John, but unfriended on Facebook or, or whatever. So there are a plethora of different ways in which you might find out that you have been abandoned by your, your partner. Um, and And whether one is more devastating than another, I think, again, is very, very hard to say with any definitiveness. But but what, what I could certainly say with some definitiveness is that there's a lot of people who've hypothesized 
that the faster that news of, of being jettisoned by your partner arrives, the worse the impact that that news has. So I have sort of built this as a ballistic theory of, of communication. Um, but there's no concrete evidence th that that's actually true. And I would guess that a lot of it really depends on the recipient, that for someone getting a, a Dear John text, that might be incredibly wounding. Um, but would that person have been any more wounded if they received that news by a letter that had taken maybe a couple of weeks to arrive? I mean, it's very hard to really figure out how one would ever satisfactorily devise metrics to, to prove that hypothesis. You know, not to linger on the uh, avenge tape thing, as you put it, but, you know, that's an example where there's very limited evidence, you know, if no evidence at all, as you say, for something like that happening. And yet, as you mentioned, there's at least one major Hollywood movie where that's a central plot point and yeah. probably a whole bunch more. And it's it's kind of the perfect example of how, you know, just like the Dear John letter, even though there might not be that hard evidence for it, it it's it's more about you know just that it's about the the way that the story gets told by these different players in the story, the different institutions, and and how people are walking around understanding or not understanding what's really going on here. Mm. So I, I'm guessing that you're referring to Jarhead there, um, right? Right. And thinking of that scene in in the movie and here we're not talking about a, a cassette we're not talking about an audio tape recording we're talking about a, a vhs video cassette if, if memory serves definitely a, a pictorial moving image tape um so yeah that probably did more than anything else to popularize the idea that women were sending these horrifically cruel recordings of themselves in that case it's with the next door neighbor um, and the movie actually amps up the how Anthony Swafford describes that scene in, in the memoir. So it, it becomes even more horrifying as as the film depicts it. But yeah, I mean, a lot there are a lot of those stories out there. I mean, you can look uh, at, at all sorts of discussion boards and places online. And the urban legend suddenly circulates very profusely, but but concrete verified cases much fewer and further between. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about a related sort of issue, um, and I wanted to get your take on on how much you think about this type of thing, but one of the things that, you know, we're doing, you know, you're doing here and, and I'm doing here as well, you know, on a, on a history podcast is you're taking stories, you're taking evidence from the past, and you're you're making an argument about it. You're making, um, hopefully, an educational argument that is going to be useful to people. You know, but on the other hand, is there this element where a historian, any historian, could be, especially when it comes to looking at like letters and times of war, you're taking this this real thing that happened that could be emotionally challenging and distressing for for real people involved, and then, you know, years later. You know, do you think that there's a, is there like an exploitative element in history? Is this something you think about where, how do I use a source ethically? And do I think about how the the person who wrote the letter would want this to be used years down the road? Is that something that crosses your mind? Or, um, you know, as a historian, you get trained on or, or anything like that? Well, it definitely crosses my mind, as I hope it would anyone who's writing history and, and who is accessing personal, intimate material that, of, of course, would be sensitive to the parties concerned. I mean, I, I think as historians, we are, whatever kind of research we do, there are always ethical issues at stake in, in terms of the need to deal sensitively with with material that that we find ourselves having access to um i came of age before there was dedicated training in in how best to do history in an ethical way but suddenly if i were doing a phd i think in in either britain or the united states now um students do receive much more training about how to go about the business in an ethically appropriate way. I mean, suddenly 
using the material that I found in archives, one is obliged appropriately to, to find out who holds the copyright, um, the people who donate materials or their parents, grandparents' materials, in some cases continue to hold the copyright, in some cases um, they release it to an archive with the understanding that, that, that researchers can then quote from it in, in their own writing. So you know, there's quite a tricky and time-consuming process of, of, of finding out you know, wh whose permission needs to be acquired um, for the various collections that one's using, in particular if you're going to, to quote from them, obviously. But of course, I mean, I think more so with this topic than with anything I've ever written, I'm, I'm highly conscious of the fact that I'm trespassing on emotional terrain that's extremely sensitive to the people concerned. So I would not use something without someone's permission. Um, and and the way in which I tell the stories, I, I hope is sensitive to the people concerned. I mean, I guess I'm almost bound to say that, of course, I don't believe that I'm doing this in an exploitative way. Um, I hope I'm doing it in a way that's careful. I want to do this to, to tell the kinds of stories that I do in a way that's mindful of, of the sensibilities of, of different players. So uh, as we talked about right at the start of our conversation, um, one of the things that I, I definitely wanted to do was to complicate the kinds of stories that get told about women who send Dear John letters. And, and, and in most cases, in almost all cases, except for a handful of examples like the go to hell female, we don't have those letters. We don't know very much about the women who send Dear John letters because those letters and their backstories don't exist. We have a different kind of, of story. So I, I hope I've gone about doing this in as ethically scrupulous a, a way as possible, but you're absolutely right that as historians, um, we're constantly having to wrestle with these sorts of questions. And that this, there is something that's really quite challenging about, you know, we have access to so much material that, that in many cases, the writers of, particularly for talking about diaries or letters, the things that historians sometimes refer to collectively as ego documents, that the people who wrote them may never have imagined would one day be bequeathed to an archive or, or be accessible to, to researchers. And so there's something perhaps a little bit voyeuristic almost about what as a historian you do when you're reading someone else's love letters or breakup notes or, or whatever it might be where they're talking about their most their most sort of deeply personal feelings that's yeah i mean it's it's an incredible privilege as a historian to be able to access that material but i think we always have to be mindful that that the people whose stuff we're reading or listening to or dealing with did not in some cases anticipate that that um later historians would come along and read or listen to it. Right. And, and the reason I ask that is just, it's been something I've been thinking about recently where you have this sort of two ways of thinking about things where there's sort of the historian's way where, you know, you just went on for five minutes about the, you know, the complicated ethics of this and the way you want to, you know, do justice to the, to the sources and do things in an ethical fashion. And, tell a story and, and educate. Um, but I think probably sadly in our current society, it's a lot easier just to take one or two documents, one or two pieces of evidence, and then fire off, you know, hot takes on Twitter. I, I think one of the things you, you talk about in the book that was interesting for me was that people during World War II, people during Vietnam uh, were, you know, doing the equivalent of that, you know, firing off hot takes on Twitter politicizing the the dear john and relationships and to me that could lead to problems is that something you found as well well i mean coming coming back to the go to hell v-mail i guess that's um perhaps something <laughs> that's comparable to to what you're describing here in as much as Anne, who who wrote go to hell under some provocation from sam its recipient had no idea and I'm sure would have been outraged to think that what he would do when he got that wouldn't be to reflect on how outrageously he'd treated her and what horrible things he'd said to provoke her into to writing this, but to send it straight to 
to Yank, which then published it. And of course, nowadays, um, you would not, uh, a sort of serious army publication would not, one imagines, publish someone's private letter without the consent of the woman who, who'd written it. So we do have some instances of, of, of things gaining public currency, achieving a life of their own, and, and because female had a, a corner in the top right-hand corner, whether the, the sender wrote his or her name and address, and because this was published in facsimile form and got well over 100 pieces of mail from complete strangers who'd seen it in Yank and wanted to tell her something about it. In some cases, they were very angry and appalled on Sam's behalf or appalled because she'd misused this patriotic stationery. But in some cases, they were writing because they wanted a pen pal or a date or her photo. Um, so the public publicization of Dear John's doesn't always lead to the same destination, but it certainly could generate all sorts of, of unforeseen consequences for the woman whose, whose letter suddenly achieves this public life that she had never envisioned. And of course, I mean, coming back to, you know, you said it's much easier to, you know, do something with documents on, on Twitter or social media. Um, I guess one difference between tweeting about history or doing history on, on social media and publishing a book is that publishers are also very keen to make sure that you have indeed done due diligence. They want to know that you got permissions for, for everything appropriately. Um, and so you couldn't behave in a completely ethically unscrupulous way and hope to have your book published by a serious press. You would hope, certainly. You would hope. <laughs> I guess as soon as I said that, I'm thinking about notorious instances of historians who have been discovered to be plagiarists um, and whose books have been published by perfectly reputable presses. Although, you know, you weren't asking me about plagiarism by per se. That's another kind of, of professional uh, malpractice and unethical behavior. Right. Um well, I guess we're coming up on, on close to an hour here, so I'm definitely mindful of your time. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to highlight about the book? I guess one perhaps good place to end, because you touched on this quite a while ago, and there was never a moment in answering one of your questions where this seemed to be the moment to, to, to make this point with, with some emphasis. Um, you said quite rightly, of course, that, that, that women get what are sometimes called Dear Jane letters. And it, it's just sort of on my mind as, as we work to a conclusion that we, we haven't really talked about the other side of, of this story. We've talked about the things that complicate relationships. We've talked about, well, at least for me, a need to be more empathetic to women who end relationships. Um, but we haven't talked about how we might invert the gendered paradigm and, and about men who write Dear Jane letters. And that's quite an interesting story in its own right, in, in part because perhaps, and this is suddenly a claim that's that's been made cyclically over time, men write fewer Dear Jane letters than women write Dear John letters, in, in part because it's much more socially accepted that a serviceman overseas might just, what we would nowadays say, um, refer to as ghosting, he might simply quit writing and in time, the woman would, would get the message that the relationship must have ended. Although it seems to me that that's actually a rather cruel thing to do if you're a deployed person overseas, because the woman who's waiting to get the next letter might well jump to all sorts of conclusions about, about her, her loved one's well-being, whether he's even still, still alive. Um, so women in all of the wars that I discuss in, in the book from World War II to the present have from time to time tried very hard to raise their voices and to say, but wait, you know, there's all of, of this sort of angry recrimination against women who write Dear John letters. There's all these angry servicemen overseas talking loudly about, about you know, their fears about infidelity, women on the home front being untrue to them. But what about the other story? What about the legions of men overseas who had sex with other women? in some cases, entered into longer standing, intimate, emotionally committed relationships with women overseas. Why is it that, that journalists and, and others 
in, in the public sphere seem so much less willing to tell stories about the servicemen who are unfaithful to their female partners than the other way around. So that was perhaps just one last piece of the story I wanted to put out there before we, we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, we could we could certainly go there. Why do you think that is the case, um, that maybe it's the media or maybe it's just you know, human nature going back all the way to the Odyssey where it's, you know, the, the man out and the woman at home. And why do you think that that asymmetry might be there? I think that asymmetry is there. I mean, you're right, of course, that the, 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 there is a, a tradition of male anxiety about female fidelity that we can trace back to Homer and Odysseus and Penelope and all the rest of it. But But my answer to your question would be about the asymmetry in gender roles and in understandings about sexuality and about soldiering. And I think there's been a very long standing, sort of tacit, if not more actively vocalized, um, sort of logic within military circles that men, red blooded servicemen, are entitled to sex as a form of, of sort of compensation, reward for soldiering. Patton famously comes out with a line that I won't repeat, uh, very much to this effect, that sex is both a reward and entitlement for, for male military service, but it's also that, that sort of um, heterosexual activity is, is the kind of fuel that, that galvanizes men and sustains their esprit. And although these ideas clearly have, have fluctuated over time, and, and that logic may I, I hope, be less pervasive in the 21st century. I think that there are very clearly quite different expectations about men and women's fidelity in wartime. I think this was certainly true um, throughout the 20th century. I mean, it was very obviously true in, in, in World War II that, that servicemen received all sorts of prompts reassuring them that it was actually um, possible <laughs> to seek sexual partners that weren't their wives or their girlfriends or their fiancés. And of course, back then, um, extramarital sex was was frowned upon, premarital sex was frowned upon, supposedly, but servicemen often got a bit more of a pass. I mean, the military was giving out free condoms, setting up pro stations, and, and so on. And of course, the message f for women was absolutely the opposite. I mean, that women were expected to be chaste, to remain faithful, um, and were, were having that message drummed into them much more loudly and insistently. And I don't think that message, even though the drumbeat may have softened somewhat over subsequent decades and in, in later conflicts, I don't think that asymmetry of gendered expectations around commitment, fidelity, and so on has, has ever really and truly gone away. Okay. Just want to say thanks for coming on. Um, appreciate your time. I think this was, was fun. So really Great. appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I, I hope your listeners enjoy the podcast. Absolutely. Um, so thanks again. Have a great day. <laughs>